Welcome to a comprehensive video on convolutional neural network or CNN. We will cover why we need them, their structure, working, applications, advantages and disadvantages. Let's get started. Convolutional neural networks are the backbone of modern computer vision because they enable machines to mimic human vision. They can recognize objects, detect patterns and even understand the context within images. But why can't we use our normal neural networks? Because if our images say 1000 cross 1000 pixels, the number of input features would be width cross height cross color channels. As this is an RGB image, the channels would be 3. So we would need 30 lakh or 3 million neurons in the input layer of neural network to process a 1000 cross 1000 RGB image. This is a huge number and would be computationally expensive for the neural network. CNNs on the other hand use convolutional layers to automatically learn hierarchical features from the image, reducing the number of parameters and enabling the network to work effectively. I hope now you are convinced about the need of CNN. Now let's learn the components of CNN and their working. Before entering the convolutional layers of a convolutional neural network, an image is typically processed to form a multidimensional matrix, often represented as a stack of RGB, red green blue matrices in the case of color images. In the case of grayscale images, the image is represented as a single 2D matrix, as there is only one channel in the input matrix. CNNs are composed of three fundamental types of layers convolutional layers, pooling layers, and fully connected layers. Let's see convolutional layer now. Convolutional layers are the building blocks of CNNs responsible for feature extraction. They help the network see certain features like edges, corners, or textures in the image. They apply a set of filters or kernels to the input data. For simplicity, consider this pixel matrix on which we will apply our operations. Now, filters are like tiny magnifying glasses that scan small parts of an image at a time. These filters are small grids made up of numbers. Let's see how a filter works. Imagine you place the filter at the top left corner of your image. Now you look through this filter at a tiny piece of the image that's right underneath it. You multiply the numbers in the filter with the corresponding pixel values in the image. After multiplying, you add up all these results. This gives you one number, which represents what the filter sees in that part of the image. The multiplication and summation is known as the convolution operation. Next, we move the filter a bit to the right or down depending on the stride. The stride defines how much the filter moves after each convolution operation. Let's say our stride is 1, which means we will shift one column to the right until we reach the end and then we will move one row down and we do the same multiplication and addition again. We keep sliding the filter until we have covered the entire image. After moving the filter one stride and performing convolution operation, the resulting matrix would look like this. After convolution, an activation function is applied to introduce nonlinearity into the network. The most commonly used activation function in CNNs is the Rectified Linear Unit or ReLU. In ReLU, all negative values in the convolution matrix are set to zero. We covered activation functions in the previous video. This simple non-linearity using activation functions enables CNNs to learn complex representations. Convolution layers are then followed by pooling layers. Pooling layers reduce the spatial dimensions of the feature maps. Feature maps are the convolution matrix we got in the previous step. 
Pooling makes the data more manageable and speeds up computations. Pooling retains the most important information from the feature maps, helping the network focus on the most relevant features. Some popular type of pooling are max pooling, average pooling, and min pooling. Let's see the working of max pooling. In max pooling, a small window, for example, 2 cross 2 or 3 cross 3, slides over the feature map. Let's say we have a 2 cross 2 window. At each position, it selects the maximum value within the window. Here, for this window, the maximum value is 8. And the process goes on. Let's move one step right at a time and fill in a similar manner. The max pooling effectively reduces the spatial dimensions of the feature map while preserving the most critical features. Average pooling is similar to max pooling, but instead of selecting the maximum value, it computes the average of the value within the window. This can help reduce the risk of overemphasizing outliers. Average pooling is sometimes preferred in scenarios where we want to reduce sensitivity to small variations in the input. With our understanding of convolution pooling layers, let's move on to the final piece, fully connected layers. Fully connected layers, also known as dense layers, come at the end of CNN architecture. They serve as the decision-making part of the network and are responsible for producing the final output. Let's delve deeper into the fully connected layers. Before passing data to a fully connected layer, the output from the preceding layers, which is often in the form of multidimensional arrays, is flattened into one-dimensional vector. Let's consider output from max pooling here. A 3 cross 3 matrix from max pooling is now converted to a 1D vector. This reshaping process turns the spatial information from earlier layers into a format that fully connected layers can work with. After flattening, the data is passed through one or more hidden fully connected layers. Each layer consists of neurons connected to every neuron in the previous layer. The hidden layers allow the network to learn increasingly abstract and high level features as you move deeper into the network. Fully connected layers typically include activation functions such as ReLU or sigmoid functions to introduce non-linearity into the network. The last fully connected layer is referred to as the output layer. Its size depends on the task. For example, classification tasks generally has a neuron for each class and regression tasks have a single neuron. Now that we have discussed the layers, let's see various applications of CNNs. CNN have a wide range of applications across various domains, with a primary focus on computer vision tasks. Due to their exceptional ability to process and analyze visual data, image classification, object detection, facial recognition, medical imaging, autonomous vehicles, natural language processing, art generation, and video analysis are some of the most widely used applications of CNN. Convolutional neural networks offer several advantages when it comes to processing images and recognizing patterns. One of their remarkable abilities is to independently learn and recognize patterns, eliminating the need for us to explicitly guide them. This self-learning capability makes CNNs incredibly efficient, especially when it comes to sorting through vast collections of visual data. However, like any tool, CNNs have their limitations. They perform best when they are given huge training data, which might not always be feasible. Additionally, training these networks can be quite demanding in terms of computational power and time. Lastly, CNNs can be somewhat like a black box. The lack of transparency can make it challenging to understand why they make specific decisions. That's it for this video. Thank you for watching.